In this video, we are going to talk about crosstalk and also we are going to learn a little bit about reflections and terminations. What? If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then uh, maybe you really may want to watch this video because it can help you a lot. And if you know what crosstalk means, it still can be very interesting video because it can uh, help you to clear some doubt. And also, uh, maybe if you are really, really good in understanding uh, crosstalk, then uh, you will find out that you completely understand what is going to happen in this video and you may get this nice feeling like I'm super clever. In this video, I'm going to talk to Eric Bogatin. Okay, so we had a call which I recorded and uh, at the beginning of this uh, video, we are going to talk about the simulations. Eric is going to set up this very simple circuit for simulation. And what is really good, you will exactly see how he will set up this circuit and it can help you to simulate your own circuit. Then we will speak about the results of this simulation and uh, Eric is going to explain why these results, they look exactly as we see them. And uh, after we finish the simulations, Eric is also going to make some measurements, real world measurements. So we are going to confirm that what we learned, what we simulated, it is really happening on real boards. I really hope you will enjoy this video. I really hope you will find it super interesting. And uh, we are going to start with the simulation. Here it is. Let's see. So I'm going to open up hyperlinks. Here is hyperlinks. And then I'm going to move us over here. Um, so the particular version of hyperlinks I'm using, this is a 2.5, and this is the, I think it's called the SI gigahertz tool. So we do signal integrity simulation. And for those of you not familiar with it, I'm not gonna you know, do the tutorial, but I'm gonna build a simple circuit. And we're gonna start with the driver. Here it is a driver. It's all the drivers in hyperlinks are IBIS based drivers. And so I'm gonna, I have a couple of favorite ones that come um, uh, pre-installed. And, um, and so, here are my favorite ones. This is in, I don't know where this name came from, but it's mod v says uh, dot ibis. And then there are a couple of different varieties in here. And the one in particular, let's see, the medium is a two nanosecond and the, uh, the fast is about 0.8. So let's use the fast one. It's got a sub nanosecond rise time. And I'm gonna use this one that's, I can do inputs and outputs. We'll do an output and, um, and there it is. Now, when I, this is one of the models that we use in my class, and we've characterized it pretty much. It's got an output impedance of about five ohms or so, uh, and a pretty fast edge. Let's look at that edge. So here's a probe. I'm just going to turn it on, and we're going to look at what that rise time is. So we look at the edge, the rising edge, and I'm going to start the simulation. We're going to look at the voltage coming off of that pin that we're simulating, and this is based on the IBIS model. And um, uh, and there, let's see, there it goes. And so here's that edge. It's, I, it's just a step coming out. That's what I told it to do. And you can see the rise time here. Um, you know, it's, it's a nanosecond division. It's a little 1090, a little under a nanosecond. And I'm going to use a little built-in tool here to calculate it for me now that I have an idea of what it is. Just make sure it's set for 1090. Yep, 1090. And um, so... You know, uh, I, I ingrain in my students rule number nine. Do you remember, have I talked to you about rule number nine? Yeah, well, we should anticipate what <sighs> we are going to expect. You passed, exactly <laughs> right, exactly right. Very, very important. And, and so, so we should before, see 0 0.8, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's about that on that order. It's, um, uh, you can read it off of here. It's a little less than a nanosecond, it's the 1090. Uh, and before you, push a measurement button and you have the scope or the instrument do the measurement for you, you should have an idea of what to expect. If you can't read it with your, this is what I tell my students all the time. 
If you can't read the value off the front screen with your Mark I eyeball, how do you expect the scope to get it? Uh, and so, so you always have to estimate it first. Okay, so let's, let's turn on, now that we have an idea, let's, let's turn on the automated measurement. And sure enough, it's a uh, uh, 830 picosecond is the rise time. So that's kind of the signal, you know, roughly fast. So now let's uh, connect it to a transmission line. And in fact, we're gonna connect it to two transmission lines. Here's the first one. And in hyperlinks, we have lots of ways of defining the transmission line, but I'm gonna use the built-in 2D field solver. And, uh, and, and, and this is how we access it. And so here is the, uh, the type stack up. Um, uh, we're, this is kind of what the, the cross section looks like. Right now, we're just gonna stay on the top layer. So we're looking at microstrip. And um, uh, let's see what the, I don't remember what the thickness is. Um, let's see, so here's the stack up. We're just gonna put our signals in the top layer and this is gonna be our return plane. We've got five mil thick dielectric there. Okay, that's good. Um, you know, this dielectric constant, this is, you know, kind of default cases, perfectly fine. We've got a little solder mask on top, not a problem. So we're just gonna keep it there. But to make a 50 ohm line, and we can use any impedance you want. And we talked a little bit about the impact of that last, last time and we'll, we'll, we can explore that in simulation. Uh, but let's see, I, I wanna add another one here. So, oh, first I wanna make it close to 50 ohms. Mm -hmm. I got a five mil thick dielectric. And so everybody should know, you know, rough estimate FR4, five mil thick dielectric, about a 10 mil wide line for 50 ohms. Well, um, my trace width is six and that's why it's a higher impedance. So let's try, if we do 10, I think it'll be a little on the low side and okay, 49 ohms, not a bad rule of thumb, right? Two to one aspect ratio gives us pretty darn close to 50 ohms. I would like to be sure everyone understand what just happened and how Eric come up with this number. So I'm going to interrupt this call and we are going to talk about this. Do you know how Eric calculated the width of the track to get 50 ohm impedance? In our situation, we are using microstrip. So uh, in our simulation, the track is routed on the top layer and the reference plane is on the second layer. This situation is called microstrip. And when you search on internet for uh, rules of thumb for transmission line, then for FR4 materials of the dielectricum, you can find something like this. If you would like to route 50 ohm impedance track as a microstrip, so on top layer, then uh, you can use this kind of rule of thumb equation. W is the width of the track, H is the height of the dielectricum, so distance between layer one and layer two. Do you remember what is the H in our stack up? Five mils. Okay, so to calculate approximately width of the track in our situation, if we would like to route it by 50 ohms, what do we need to do? We need to multiply the height of the dielectricum by two, and we will get the approximate width for 50 ohm impedance track. So five mil multiplied by two is 10 mils, and that's why Eric used 10 mils for the width of the track. Okay, let's continue. Okay, here's a 49 ohm line on this layer. And I wanna add another signal line on this layer in order to have some crosstalk, right? So here's how I'm, I'm gonna do that. I am literally gonna take another transmission line. I'm gonna add it in here. And now when I select what kind I want, I'm gonna say, I wanna stack it, but I wanna use the same coupling region. And so here is, here's the other line that I just added, but uh, I also wanna use the same line width and that was um, 10 mils. So here are our two lines. They're both, you know, 48, 49 ohms. Uh, and I can change the spacing. Here's the edge to edge space between them. And I'm gonna make a spacing equal to the line width and we can change that. So here is, here are my two lines. And I'm going to use one as the aggressor and the other as the victim line. Okay. Now, just to make it easy initially to see what's going on, I got about a five ohm output impedance on this guy. If I just leave the ends open, uh, so I'm going to connect this guy in here. If I just leave the ends open, 
you know you're going to have reflections. And those reflections are going to make it a more complicated problem to think about the crosstalk. And so to start out, let's terminate the lines so that we don't have the reflections. We'll look at the crosstalk, and then we'll see the impact turning on the reflections. Okay? And so the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make these lines a little longer. And because they're coupled, they're both exactly the same length. And uh, because I have about a nanosecond edge, rise time is about six inches, just to make it easy, I'm going to make this a 12-inch long line. And so here's our 12-inch line. So the time delay is about twice the rise time of the, of the line. And let's add some terminations on the ends. Uh, and so I'm going to, I'll just grab, well, let's see, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to use this one here. I'm going to put this guy here. I'm going to put this guy over here. I'm going to put terminations on all the ends first, then we'll turn them off as we need to. And then I'm going to add a ground over here, a ground, a ground over here. And we'll add one more ground over here. So here's our circuit. And, and of course, we need to um, change the resistor. And for foreign termination, of course, what value resistor should we use over here? Mm, for depends on what the results we would like to get. Well, we want to terminate the line so we don't have the complication of the reflections. Mm. So here's a, you know, 50. pretty darn close. Yes, yeah, pretty darn close to 50 ohms. So we'll make a 50 ohm resistor here. And, and to terminate this line, same thing. If anything gets on this line and it propagates this way, we don't want it to reflect for now. So we'll make this one 50 as well and this one 50 as well. And so you can say, well, wait a minute. The impedance of the line isn't 50, it's 48.7. Shouldn't I use a 48.7 ohm line? Well, this is the really cool part of simulation is in principle, yes, but in practice, there's going to be a little bit of reflection, but you know, a little bit may be perfectly fine. And if you have 50 ohms resistors that are cheaper than 48.7 ohm resistors, why not use the 40, 50 ohm resistors? And you can tell in simulation what the impact of that is. Even we'll, PCB we'll line may not be exactly 48.7. There you so go. Exactly. Plus and minus. that's part of, you're exactly right. And that's part of, you know, the tolerance analysis. And, you know, large OEMs, when they do the analysis, they'll do a Monte Carlo simulation and vary the lines, you know, plus or minus 10 ohm, uh, 10% to see what the stability of the design is. Okay, so uh, we're ready to take a look. And we're going to look at the far end signal. And we're gonna look at the, so this is the aggressor. Here's the victim line. We're gonna look over here and here on the victim line. And, and so when we look over here, so let's set up our simulation. And I'm going to, let's see, I don't care about the source anymore. I'm gonna turn him off, but I'm gonna look over here at R1. So I'm gonna turn R1 on. I'm gonna look over here at R2. That's the far end on the, on the quiet line. You know, purple doesn't show up real well, so I'm going to change that. I'm going to make it yellow. Okay. And then we're going to look at the near end over here, which is R3. And um, yeah, I think blue will be okay. It's, it's hard to see, um, hard to see that yellow, but there's a yellow over here. Yeah, I see. It'll be really easy to see in the in the screen. Okay. So remember rule number nine before we. Simulate, let's think about what we expect to see. So in fact, we're just gonna turn them on selectively. Let's take a look at um, what's gonna be at the far end. I have it set up for an edge. So we'll look at a rising edge. What do you think we're gonna see at the far end over here? Um, because we meet the impedance, the edge should be quite okay. Yeah, should be pretty good, shouldn't see much It reflection. should be pretty similar to the output, basically. Yeah, slightly lower voltage. And yeah. there it is. Pretty nice looking signal coming out. It's 3.3 coming out, but because of the voltage drop, it's three at the receiver, okay? And let's see, so that's the signal coming out. Now, what are we gonna see if we look at the near end? Do you remember uh, from the last yeah, video? Yeah, we should see uh, a little bit longer and a little bit uh, higher voltage, but not very high but should be a little bit longer. Right. I don't know exactly and, and, how long. And it's going to last for, let's see, it's going to see, we're going to see it initially as soon as that signal comes out of here. Uh, this of course is delayed. So we're going to see the near end, you know, coming out over here somewhere. 
it's going to uh, appear there for as long as the signal goes here, that's 1.7 nanoseconds, and then getting back, that's like three and a half nanoseconds. So let's look at uh, R3. And sure enough, here it is. A little hard to see, so we're going to zoom in. This is just like a scope. So we're going to zoom in on that edge. And uh, there we go. So here's that signal turning on. And, uh, and then it lasts for, you know, from here. Well, let's see, we'll see it from here to here, roughly, is um, the three and a half nanoseconds plus the rise time. There's and the why 4. is it 6. three and a half? I would expect it would be only, ah, okay, because when it arrives at the end, it still needs to go back. Exactly. Okay. It's, it's so the it's round all time, time when it goes there, and then also it has to go back from the Yeah, okay. right, right. Uh, okay, and it turns on with the rise time of the signal, you know, roughly a division here, fraction of a nanosecond. Turns on with the rise time, lasts for a round trip time of the interconnect, and then turns off, and then it's gone. It's history, nothing else. Okay. That's the near end. And then the far end, what do you think we're going to see if we look over here at the far end? I'm going to interrupt our call uh, and what you think. How this uh, yellow waveform is going to look, how the far end crosstalk on this victim line is going to look. And uh, in the next minute or so, I'm going to explain what I think, how it is going to look, and I'm wrong. I'm like very wrong, so please don't listen to me next one minute or something like that. Uh, originally, I wanted to cut out uh, this part of the call where I'm wrong, but uh, when I cut it out, it made the call even more confusing. So I just, I just left it there and uh, you can see that how wrong I was. Okay, let's continue with the call. So please ignore me for next one minute. Okay, uh, we should see it basically at the same time where is the edge. So somewhere within the 0 0.8 and we should see the cumulative uh, area what is maybe there, but up. Right, so I'm gonna up go to back. half so we... of the voltage, maybe I do. Yeah. yeah. So here's, here's the midpoint. And so when the signal comes out, we're gonna see the far end and it's gonna, la it's gonna be in the derivative of the shape and it's gonna be in microsoft, it's gonna be negative. And so we're gonna see a little dip over here. Uh, let's, let's see, what's that? That's R2, here's R2. And there it is. Now, let me... Oh, like, that's wrong. Uh, okay, me, because uh, ah, I in. forgot because they cancel each other. Uh, what, what cancels each other? The, uh, the uh, inductive and capacitive part? Well, almost. They, they don't quite cancel because um, uh, the inductive is a little large in microstrip. Okay, the inductive is a little larger than capacitive. Okay. Strip line, that would be the case. Um, so, in fact, uh, let, we can do that just real quick. Let me move this to the strip line. And let me move this one to the strip line. Now, um, they are 42 ohms, so they're kind of low. So, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to increase this dielectric thickness just a tad here, just so that um, we get closer to um, 50 uh, 50 ohms. So, so here's that layer, uh, the thickness. Let's see if I make it uh, uh, eight mils. Let's see what we get for our impedance. Ah, 52 ohms. That's pretty good, huh? <laughs> so same thing, five, uh, 10 mil wide line, 10 mil space. Here's the 10 mil space, uh, but in strip line. And so in strip they line- They cancel each other. Right, so shouldn't have far and cross second strip lines. So let's okay. just you know rerun the simulation, and so we have a little bit more uh, far end. Uh, so a little bit more more near end because they're the planes are farther apart, and the far end is reduced. There's still a little bit of far end crosstalk here, but um, let's see why that is. If we go to the um, stack up, so we we'll, we can get there a couple of ways. We'll just do it from here, and we look at the stack up. So um, uh, let's see. So we have, 
So I think this is partly why we have um, two dielectric layers yeah, between 3. the planes. 3.8 and 4.5. Oh, very good, right. And so if we make this, this is what's great about um, simulator. We can test our assumptions and test our consistency tests. And so let's, the, the, if the fact that we had foreign crosstalk suggests that we have some asymmetry in the dielectric constants in the stack up. If that's true, and we make the dielectric constants the same, then we shouldn't have the foreign crosstalk. So let's make this 3.8. We say, okay. We go back here. Oh, the impedance is a little bit on the high side. So, you know, just, you know, just because it's easy to do. If we want to lower the impedance a little bit, we made the dielectric constant uh, a, a little bit less here. So um, uh, let's make this seven. And, and that will lower the impedance and maybe we'll get closer to 50 ohms. Oh boy, that was pretty darn close. Okay, so this is where having good engineering intuition is so valuable because you know what direction to move things and you are in control of the simulator instead of the simulator controlling you. That's why the rule number nine is so valuable in addition to finding mistakes that I make all the time. So now we've got it in strip line so now, and, and it's the same dielectric constant everywhere. And so what should the foreign crosstalk be? Yeah, it shouldn't be flat. It shouldn't have any. All right, so let's run that simulation. Ooh, look at that. It completely ah. went away. And, and so don't you get a nice warm feeling when you get a result that is exactly what you expect, especially in a complicated system. And that's why rule number one is so valuable because number one, it feels really good. And number two, it helps build your confidence that, hey, maybe I do understand what's going on. I'm going to interrupt this call because I would like to be sure everyone understands what we are talking about. And if you haven't watched our previous video with Eric, then very simply and very quickly, I'm going to explain what's going on. Uh, when your signal or when an edge is traveling through your PCB track, then uh, this edge is going to generate two kinds of crosstalk, near-end crosstalk and far-end crosstalk. And uh, the near-end crosstalk is uh, traveling the opposite direction as the edge is traveling. Okay, I'm going into our simulation and I'm going to explain it here. So basically, this is our PCB track, okay? And from this output, the signal, the edge is traveling through this PCB track, this direction. And uh, in the opposite direction, the near end crosstalk is going to be generated on our victim track. This is called victim track. This one is called aggressor. Uh, so on this, uh, other track is going to be the near end crosstalk traveling the different direction, the opposite direction as the signal is traveling. And that's why on this side of the track, we can measure this blue line. This is the near end crosstalk. That's exactly uh, what we can see basically here. Okay. Now, far end crosstalk is traveling together with the edge and we can measure it on the other side of the track. So basically, when we have a look on this simulation, the uh, far end crosstalk will travel together with the edge. That's what we measure on this side of the track, and that's this yellow line, which is here. With this far, uh, far, far end crosstalk, it's a little bit more complicated because uh, this Far end crosstalk depends on the environment around your tracks. The uh, crosstalk has uh, two kinds of contribution, inductive and capacitive contribution. And basically, when uh, the environment around the tracks is exactly the same, then the capacitive and inductive contribution to the crosstalk is going to be exactly the same, but the opposite uh, direction. So they are going to cancel each other. 
basically when the environment around the tracks is same you will not see here any far end crosstalk however if the environment around the tracks is not same for example if above the tracks there is air and below the tracks uh, there is some dielectricum then uh, the contribution of the capacitive and inductive crosstalk is not going to be same and we will see some of far end crosstalk here when we go to our simulation and when we have a look at the far end crosstalk in our simulation that's this yellow line and that's what we can see here okay so i really hope now you understand what eric was doing and what uh, we were talking about when uh, when he was running this simulation and now i have got curious because it's quite interesting that when you route these tracks in the same environment then uh, this far end crosstalk is going to be flat it's it's very interesting that when you route these tracks in same environment that then the contribution from the capacitive far end crosstalk is going to be exactly same as the contribution from the inductive uh, part of the far end crosstalk but the opposite so because it's interesting i ask eric about this and that's what we are going to talk about next here is the clip i would like to ask yes uh, what if you use like higher voltage or higher currents flowing through these tracks are they are they going to change the uh kind of you know how much capacitive or inductive uh, effect is going to be on this uh, crosstalk so here's what happens. So there are two questions you ask. One is, if we change the voltage of the driver, does that change the capacitive and inductive coupling? So those are the properties of the interconnect, different from the, the near and far end voltage that we see. The, the all interconnects, with very, very, very few exceptions, all interconnects are what we call linear, passive, time invariant. In other words, um, the, the term superposition applies. It does, there, there are electrical properties, the capacitance, the inductance, the characteristic impedance you see, all of those are completely independent of the strength of the voltage applied or the current through them. The parasitic values, completely independent of the signal imposed. They are intrinsic to the interconnect structure, just about the geometry material properties. Okay, so it will be the effect will be always the same. It doesn't matter if voltage is going to be very high and or current is going so to the be very high. Coupling coefficients, the, the parasitic values are always going to be exactly the same. But the value of the crosstalk, the voltage that we see at the near end, scales with in this case the voltage of the signal. So if I double the voltage of the signal, I'm gonna get twice as much near end crosstalk. So that will change. But not um, far and, end crosstalk. It will be oh, always well. Flat. No, every all the 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 voltage. Well, of course, in strip line, you're absolutely right. We've engineered this okay. to eliminate far end crosstalk. And so, if I double this voltage, yeah, I'm going to double the far end crosstalk, and twice zero is still zero. Okay, because you know, I was thinking like, uh, if we increase current, then I thought the, uh, you know, when we were running the animation, I saw like this current uh, contribution to the uh, far end crosstalk is going to be higher because there is higher current so it's going to induct more voltage but how would you go about increasing the current um, a lower impedance ah so you're <laughs> going to change the interconnect structure okay okay yeah I don't know. So in, in this <laughs> environment that we're in, we, we've just engineered these transmission lines. They're electrically long. And so the signal gets launched. It sees an impedance me. going in. And right. And so anything we want to do to increase the current is going to increase the voltage. That's how you do it is increase the voltage, gives you more current, scales completely with the, the voltage going in. But if you change the geometry, or we'll see in a second here, if we change the termination, that will change the 
the shape of the of the signal because of the reflections. Okay. So so let's try that. Suppose that um, suppose that we made so we're in strip line now, right? So we only have near and cross off. Um, let's see. Suppose that we made the far end of this guy open. What do you think we would see? How is the near end cross going to be affected? Do you think if we just make this, I'll, I'll make this one e to the six, so it's really high impedance now. What do you think the near end is going to do? Uh, first, I would think uh, how the signal is going to look the uh, green one. So the green one okay. yeah. would probably go maybe up and then down. I don't know. Okay, very good. So I told you this is a five ohm output impedance. Yeah. High impedance here. This is uh, you know two two nanoseconds because we're in a strip line environment. The the time delay got a little bit bigger. Two yeah. nanosecond time delay. So a signal's going to hit here. It's going to reflect. Come back. It's going to change sign and reflect from here, head back, reflect, come back, change sign again. And so we're going to see ringing over here, yeah, right? I, I would like line. overshoot and then some ringing. Some, yeah. Maybe. I and don't because know. the time delay is long compared to the rise time, we're going to see them as discrete steps in the ringing. Okay. But initially, when we look, you know, right at this early, so here I, I changed the scale on you here. Let's go, go back here. This initial rise time, how is that going to be affected? Initial should be same because we are basically, until it hits the end, it should be same. So, our, so exactly it, right. Yeah. Right. So this won't be affected, but we're not done because when we hit the end over here, we're going to reflect and head back. And so we now have another signal traveling this way down the interconnect. Higher signal, I guess. Uh, well, it'll be about the same value, right? Because it reflected from an open. But it's so going to be, be oh, okay. Right, because if three volt goes in, we're going to see three volt reflecting. It's uh -huh. about the same. It's going to be heading this way back to the source. So this is the forward direction now. We're going to see far end or forward uh, uh, crosstalk on, even though this is physically the near end, this is the forward direction that reflects. Thing. So we're going to see far end crosstalk. How much is that going to be? It's flat. In the strip line, and no. it's going to be zero, right? We're not going to see it. But this is the, um, the, the, the backward direction now for the reflected wave. And so this is going to go this way. We're going to see uh, this is the backward end. So we're going to see near end crosstalk from over the here. reflection. Yeah, from the reflected signal. Yeah. And then the reflection is going to hit here. It's going to change sign and go back this way. And so this becomes the near end, but it's negative. And so we're going to see this signature, and then we're going to see a negative, and then we're going to see ringing in the near end crosstalk. And we're going to look over here, and we're going to say suddenly, oh my gosh, we've got far end crosstalk that looks like near end. Right? This is where simulation is so valuable, because once you get an idea of kind of the pattern, you can't keep, keep it all in your head. You got to do the simulation. Yeah. Okay. So let, let's try it and see. So I'm, I'm going to expand the time base a little bit. So we can see now. First, you know, I'm gonna. I have to use different scales because we're looking at different effects. So let's look at the signal first, and we're gonna see the ringing in the signal because this is what we get. So there's the, uh, and and you know, I'm gonna even do it a little bit more time. So here's that ringing at the far end because it's going back and forth, and it's electrically long. That's why it's gonna kind of flat, flat top and bottoms. Okay. Now let's look at the near end crosstalk. So we zoom in and look, here's that near end that we, you know, it's a little hard to see. This is the same as we had before. So, um, you know, I'm just going to make this 50 ohms so we can do a quick comparison on this scale. Uh, and, and you know what, I'm going to show the previous one so we can do that quick comparison. Now, I don't know if you can see, but these two, the initial with all the ringing and this one, when I made this 50 ohms, they're exactly mm -hmm. the I same. See it. I see it. It's this stuff here that's, that's different. So initially, you were right. It's exactly the same, independent, because how does this guy here know I changed the termination? He has to wait for the signal to get here and then back for me to know. Okay, so let's go back and we'll look at this guy, 1e e to the 6. Uh, we'll run that simulation. We'll get rid of our previous one. And so here we see, because of the change in sign, the negative signal going this way, that's why we have negative 
uh, far, near and cross sock positive, negative near. And so the reflections back and forth are generating uh, near and cross sock. And at the same time, the signal heading this way is generating near and cross sock over here. And darned if they don't look almost identical. So it's a complicated pattern, but it's easy to understand based on keeping track of the directions and what one signal sees. That's in. And what is the frequency? So the frequency depends on the length of the trace. Very good. And, and so when you look at the ringing, and I have to reduce the scale to see it. So what determines the, the uh, frequency of this ringing? It's definitely length, but I, I'm not sure right. what. So, so here's what it is. Let's see. We get the signal coming out over here. That's right here. It reflects heads down. That's one time delay. Sees the low impedance. Reflects heads back. That's a second time delay. We see the negative. And so this, from this peak to this dip, that is a round trip time. And now it hits here. It reflects heads here and comes back. And then... So, so this is time. the start, four time delays, right. And so the period is four time delays. Nice. That's right. This is really cool, actually. Isn't this cool? Yeah, that's what I love about uh, it. And that's why I think every engineer should have a simple to use simulator tool at their disposal so they can do these simple kind of what if. But you need to know how to use it. All these settings, what you just showed me, uh -huh. I was like, oh, I had no idea you can do this you know in what? simulator. So I, I, I use this as the tool that we use in our advanced PCB class. And I would say the learning curve is about 15, 20 minutes. And then every example that you run, especially you have a guide to you can follow, you pick up another trick, another trick. And it's an intuitive enough, enough tool that if you understand a little bit of what to expect to see, you can anticipate what the the menu items do and, and how to run it. So it's, this is one of the uh, lowest learning curve, uh, high performance professional level simulation tools out there. Hyperlinks? Hyperlinks. So this was strip line. Let's go back and make these micro strip. And so I'm gonna move him up. So now he's strip lined. Uh, I'm sorry, micro strip. I'm gonna move him up. And now he's microstrip as well. And I'm back to my 49 ohms. And now I'm back to, okay, microstrip. And let's go back to making this guy 50 ohms as well. And so this is the special case. Now in microstrip, what are we gonna see? Oh, uh, now I'm, I need to switch my brain. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll help you a little bit. So. You know, we'll still see the signal coming out. It's terminated, so it'll be, and we have an edge only, so we'll see the step edge going in. We'll see the near end signature over here, which will look the same as strip line, but a little less amplitude because the coefficients are less. But now over here, we're going to see the far and crosstalk. Yeah. Okay, so let's just take a look at that. And here we go. Okay. Now, perfect. I'm going to expand the scale, and then we're going to come, uh, but we're going to come back to this. And you see that. The, and this is really, let me see if I can get them both on the same scale. Okay, so you can see that here's the signature of near end, just like we expect to see. Here's signature of farm, but it looks a little funny, right? Because it's got these little humpy things in them. That's not what I expected to see. But remember, far end crosstalk is really the derivative. It's the DIDT and the DVDT, the derivative of this. And if you look closely, I don't know, maybe if I expand it a little bit, you can see it a little more clearly. So can you it see it's got a funny edge? shape. Yeah, it's got a funny shape to it. And so we're really kind of mapping the derivative of this edge. That's why it's got that funny shape to it. Um, and even without the coupling, we got that funny, and it's just because of the model for this driver. If I, I have find one question a, when we yeah. are talking about the driver. Uh, yeah. In this uh, impedance matching, is it important uh, what is going to be impedance value of the driver? Okay, very good question. When I terminated the two transmission lines, the, um, the termination strategy I used was far end. And in this termination strategy, um, what, how do I select 
the value of the resistors? What does it depend on? In, uh, in far termination, termination is based on the uh, track impedance. Right, because basically what I'm trying to do is terminate the signal that is traveling down the transmission line. It sees, you know, 49 ohm, 49, 49, 49, 49. I want to match the impedance of the path the signal's in. And so it's all about the impedance of the line. And so change this, as long as I use far end termination, no impact. If I use other termination strategies, or if I worried about the voltage launched line, then I worry about the output impedance. But I think what can be important is if the other track is using five ohm uh, on the other side, R3 is five ohm, then that would influence, for example, the cross talk results. So it will, inf it will not influence the signal that's coupled over and propagates in the quiet line. What it will influence, as we saw, are the reflections. Mm -hmm. And so that's where, that's the secret to understanding crosstalk is fundamentally it's due to the coupling between the transmission lines, independent of what happens on the ends. But once the signal gets to the ends, they're, they're just like any other signal influenced by the termination. So that's when the impedance of output still can Very influence good. the signal. Right. So if I stuck this driver over here, then the the near end noise, so if there's a, uh, a bus and then they were all uh, in, the, in the same direction, non-interleaved, then um, the, even if there was nothing or if there was a zero coming out of this guy, then I would see when my near end signal heads here, it's going to see 50, 50, 50. It's going to see five ohms. It'll change sign and reflect. Perfect. Exactly right. Perfect. If it's tri-stated, it'll be open. Okay, we can continue. You answered okay. my question. Okay, so um, let's see, what do we want to do? Um, okay, that's, that's good. So here we see the signature. What happens, so I'm going to zoom out on that so we can see that a little bit more clearly. So here's the signature of the noise. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit more. Suppose that we were to move the traces farther apart. What do you think is going to happen to that, to that crosstalk? If we move Increase the traces apart, it's going to yeah. be all over. So, uh, so right now, the separation is, um, uh, is 10 mils, 10 mil wide line, 10 mil space. Suppose we made it 20 mils. What do you think is going to happen to, so, so now we make it 20 mils, should be lower, right? They're both going to be decreased, right? And so just to save it with the previous one. And so there it is. It's a lot less. That's the number one most important way of controlling crosstalk is we make them farther apart. And, and, and you can kind of see, well, how do we characterize the crosstalk? Well, you know, the, the, when, when we're electrically long, look, the near end crosstalk reaches a constant value. And so that ratio of that constant amount of crosstalk to the signal, because remember they scale, the ratio stays the same. That's a figure of merit. And we call that ratio of this amount of crosstalk, the, you know, it's roughly about 120 millivolts out of what's our signal. Our signal, I can't quite see it up there at the top. Let's change the scale. Our signal is three volts. So 120 millivolts, 0.12 volts out of three volts. That's about um, uh, 3%. That is our figure of merit for describing near end crosstalk. That is the figure of, that's what we call the near end crosstalk coefficient. And now we can scale. You tell me the voltage coming out. I'll tell you how much crosstalk voltage we'll see over here. Far end crosstalk is a little bit more difficult now because it's related to not just the, it's, it's not a flat response. It's, it's kind of funny peak because of the shape of the edge here. But if I made that rise time shorter, I would get a sharper peak, more far end crosstalk. If I made the coupling longer, the near end crosstalk doesn't change, but the far end will. And so getting a figure of merit for far end crosstalk, a little more difficult because it scales inversely with rise time and, and uh, linearly with length. And so I have to factor those scaling terms out to get a figure of merit for near end, for, for far end crosstalk. But that's where a simulator comes in. This is a 2D field solver built into hyperlinks that automatically calculates those electric fields. 
And if, if I look at this guy, I can actually see the electric fields between these guys that, uh, that this is the aggressor, here's the victim. Uh, we can kind of visualize those electric fields between them. And, and all that is calculated for us automatically every time we do the simulation uh, with the built-in 2D field solver. So, so this is basically how it calculates the crosstalk based on the fields, yeah? Exactly. You need that because unfortunately, the crosstalk is all about the fringe fields. No good approximations for that. You really need a 2D field solver. Um, okay, you know, I, I have a limited time and I want to do one last thing. Now that we've seen how to simulate near-end crosstalk, okay. let's look at how we measure it. Okay. Okay, so here's what I'm doing. I'm going to turn off hyperlinks. Close that down. And now I'm going to bring you into my lab. In my lab here, here's the lab bench. And um, uh, here is my scope. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, I've got a little test board here that uh, one of my students has uh, uh, designed and built. We use this in uh, uh, one of our labs. And it's just got, it's a two layer board. Uh, it's a, you know, 063 or 062, 59 mil thick dielectric to make a 50 ohm line for um, 50, or a 50 ohm line for 59 mils thick for this dielectric constant, it's about a hundred mil wide line. And so that's why we have hundred mil wide lines here uh, and they different spacings, right? And we saw that as we bring them closer, yeah, we're gonna get more uh, crosstalk. And it's microstrip, so we're going to have near and far end crosstalk. So let's see. So this one, so very nicely, uh, my student Aditya, he he labeled this is two line widths apart. Here's one line width apart. Here's a half a line width apart. So um, and and so what I'm going to do is uh, we've got my scope, and this is a really um, a high bandwidth scope. Uh, it's an eight gigahertz bandwidth, and we've got a um, a signal coming out of here that can be a fast edge, about a quarter of a nanosecond. So we're gonna dry, use this as our driver. It's 50 ohm source impedance, we use it as a driver. We'll send it through one of the lines and we will look at the signal um, coming out. So we'll, we'll look at the signal coming out and we'll also look at the noise at the near end and the far end. Okay, okay so that's, really that's gonna be our plan. Now which, so which one would you like to look at? We have two lines apart, so there's a little bit of crosstalk. One line with and half a line with apart. Which one do you want to look at? Uh, a lot of crosstalk. Okay, so you are just like all of my students. When I say, <laughs> hey, which one do you want to look at? They always say, oh, let's look at the one that's really close. Let's see a lot of crosstalk. Well, um, uh, this is it's just one more. Is to be too messy huh? then? Or? Uh, I don't think so. It'll be a lot of crosstalk. So let's, <laughs> let's set up the scope. And so um, I'm going to do this in real time here. So uh, we're going to have the signal coming out and oops, I'm sorry, wrong one. It goes into auxiliary out and this is signal coming out. And then, you know what, before we send it through the board, let's just look at it uh, with the scope. And okay. um, now it's hard for you guys to see my scope. And so I'm gonna uh, do something uh, uh, really clever for you. Our scope, so this is a Teledyne and LaCroix uh, Wave, uh, Wave Pro HD scope. It's kind of the higher end of the mid-class scopes. Uh, it's a PC. Now, I'm going to interrupt Eric because I have got curious. Um, did you notice the brand of the scope, what they use in the lab? Teledyne. And uh, I remember this... Uh, name from uh, the website with Eric's uh, online classes. It says also Teledyne. So I uh, was like, what's the connection of Teledyne with Eric? Is, is it like his company or? So I just asked, okay? And that's what Eric is going to answer uh, Next, uh, he's going to talk a little bit about his connection with Teledyne company. Let's continue. Here is the next clip. Now I'm curious because uh, I thought the Teledyne is your company or... Okay, so here's the deal. And I'll let all of your viewers know. Um, at the beginning of this year, I retired from Teledyne LaCroix. Um, I am 
now a fellow at Teledyne LaCroix, uh, which basically means I can do anything I want and just, you know, kind of, I still am, am friends with them and I still do occasional webinars with uh, Teledyne LaCroix, but uh, I'm a fellow there, but I'm full-time at University of Colorado in Boulder, um, uh, 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 teaching um, our signal integrity and PCB design classes. And Teledyne LaCroix is very uh, gracious and generous. They donated a lot of equipment here for us. So we use this in our teaching lab and, and full disclosure, um, uh, Keysight has also been very nice to us and they've gener they, they have donated some equipment to us as well. And any other listeners out there that uh, would like to donate some equipment to us, um, please contact me. Uh, email is eric.bogatin at colorado.edu. Would love to chat with you. And uh, all of this goes toward teaching our, um, uh, our undergraduates and our graduate students. Uh, so we're using a you know, pretty sophisticated professional level scope here, but because it's a PC, I'm running um, uh, TeamViewer on it and I have TeamViewer on my laptop. And so we can see the screen in, in much higher resolution. And so um, I'm going to um, grab the scope screen here and let me make it um, bigger for us. So this is literally the, the scope. Uh, and so we're gonna look at the, um, uh, the signal coming out because we have the output connected. And so I, I gotta do a couple things here. I, I have to uh, tell it, hey, let's use the, um, we got utilities here. Uh, let's do the uh, auxiliary output and we got a, a uh, fast edge. So uh, here you can see the stuff. I want this as our output. There we go. And, um, and it's gonna be um, you know, a one volt kind of signal. And now let's see that signal. And so I'm gonna change the scale here. And here we go. So okay. here's our signal. Now it looks a little distorted. And, if, and this is where, again, you have to understand scopes and what to expect. And, and this is part of what we teach in our classes. But I have the scale on one meg input. And that means I have the signal coming out, reflecting, bouncing back. Yeah, it's, it's 50 ohms. Uh, in the scope, so minimizes reflections, but it's the amplifier here is not as fast as if I put it on 50 ohms. So I'm going to move this to 50 ohms. Mm -hmm. And now we have a much wow. cleaner signal, right? Nice. That's why we have 50 ohms, no more reflections, and it's a higher bandwidth amplifier as well. And we can, you know, we can zoom in here and read what the um, rise time is. Here we go. Now we're pushing this poor scope to only 20 giga samples a second at 12 bit vertical resolution. Um, and so that means every 50 picoseconds, we're taking a data point and you can see here, you know, maybe it's 200 picoseconds is the rise time here. And if I'm clever, I can have, now that I know what to expect, I can have the scope measure it for me. So I'll turn on my measurements. I like statistics. I'm gonna turn on the statistics and let's see. I, I want to get the rise time. So I'm going to set up the parameter of rise time. That's a horizontal measurement. And so let's see, looking for rise time. Here we go. Here's the rise time. And I wanted to go to channel one. And here it is. 230 nanos, uh, I'm sorry, 230 picoseconds is the rise, quarter of a nanosecond is the rise time. Okay. That's the signal that's coming out of the scope that is going directly into the back into the scope. So this is our source. So now I'm gonna take that out. And now that's gonna go into, let's go back to the camera and I'll show you what I'm doing here. Oh, you need to activate the camera uh, window. Yeah, okay. I need to uh, get this a little closer here so you can see it. So here's the board, here's the, uh, the setup. And so we're gonna come in over here. Oh, I'm sorry, we wanted the fast one. The, Close space one. Yes. <laughs> so here's the lots of crosstalk. So we go in here. We're going to look at what comes out the other end. So that's going to be the signal over here. And let's put that into channel one of the scope. Now, because we've got the signal coming out, we ought to see it coming out. So let's take a look at that. Ooh, there it is. And can you see that on your screen? Here's the scope yes, trace over here. Okay. And do you remember 
I, I have to clear the sweeps because we changed things here. We'll start over again. Do you remember what we measured that rise time as coming out of the scope and going directly into the, uh, into it back into the scope? Do you remember that rise time? It was similar, no? 200. It, it was about 0. 0.23 to yeah. 4. It's a little longer. Yeah. Why do you think it's a little longer? Because we have all these cables and track. Mostly because of the uh, the losses or in the dielectric. Loss? Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. It's mostly the because it's you know pretty clean system. Otherwise, it's the losses and not a large path, but a little bit of a path. But you know, and and you can kind of see the shape of this signal. And I'm, I'm zooming out. Yeah, it goes. And so it's a little bit slopier signal. It's not so perfect to turning on quickly and saying, "Clearly, we have this long tail to it." That's because of the losses. A little bit in losses in the cable, but I think also losses in frequency dependent losses in the dielectric material. But it's still pretty good. Half a nanosecond coming out, right? So now let's look at near end crosstalk. And, um, uh, and so we're going to look at, oops, here's the camera. We're going to look at near end crosstalk on the near end. And um, now, just to just to um, minimize the confusion, I'm going to connect the far end as well. We're just not going to look at it, and okay. and I'm going to connect it into the scope here, and I'm going to make sure that's in channel three in the scope. Okay. And and I'm going to make sure that channel three is 50 ohm terminated. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to look at it. We're going to pretend we didn't see that. So that <laughs> we terminate it so that we don't have the reflections. Like we said. And then we're going to disconnect it and we'll see what it looks like. So now I'm ready to, uh, uh, we've got the near end connected. Let's look at the near end crosstalk. And that's going to be channel two. And what do you think? Remember rule number nine, before we turn it on, what do you expect to see? Um. I, I would expect uh, something similar as what we've seen in simulation. So right. uh, something what goes a little bit up, uh, then it stays a little bit up, and then it goes down. Right. So it should be, you know, kind of sort of flat. It's not a very long path. It's only, you know, about less than, than you know, it's about three inches long, four, um, four inches long. The coupling length is about three inches. So it's not going to be a very, you know, constant value here. But let's take a look at it. So here, I'm going to move it over to here. And, uh, hmm, you know, it looks a little funny, <laughs> huh? Right? Why do you think that? Rule number nine, right? It's not what we expect. There's always a reason why. Sometimes because we screwed up. Sometimes because, gee, we don't really understand what's going on, but we need to change our energy. We need to move up the learning curve a little bit. In this case, you know, my, my first reaction, I tell my students is, I, I've learned in life, I make a lot of mistakes. My wife will be the first to tell you, I make a lot of mistakes. And so my first reaction is I screwed up. How did I screw up? And can you see how I screwed up and why? Did you it set doesn't... up impedance for channel two? Very good, exactly right. And so I look over here and even says that, I don't know if you can read it, it says one meg input, channel two is one meg input. And so what's happening, I'm getting a bunch of reflections now in the cable. Uh, in fact, if I zoom out a lot more, maybe we'll see uh, some of those reflections and the cable, nah, they, they kind of die out a little bit. So, um, but I, I'm seeing the reflections because it's 50 ohm, because it, it's one meg. So let's make that 50 ohms. Ooh, yeah, nice. is that cool or what? <laughs> so let me expand that a little bit just so we can see it. And, and, and I'm going to expand the time base here as well. So I'm doing all this just with mouse controls on my laptop. Uh, that's the nice thing about um, the high-end um, scopes these days. Uh, they're all mouse controlled and you can do remote, con I'm doing a remote control of it here. Um, so is this the near-end signature? Exactly what we expect to see. Now let's look at, I'll make this a little bigger too, just to, to see it. Um, you know, the other thing I can do is uh, we're, we're pushing this poor little scope to its limit, 20 giga samples. We see the individual samples. Let me let me average a little bit. So I'll average this waveform, um, and we'll do it for 
um, 25 sweeps. It'll just clean it up a little bit and I'll average this one for 25 sweeps. There we go. Now that's the near end. Shall we look at the far end? Yeah. Now remember that's connected here into channel three and uh, let's, let's uh, turn on channel three. So we'll add channel three to it. There we are. And there is the far end cross. Now let's, let's put them on the same scale. So um, I've got the near end cross lock on 20 millivolts of division. Let's put the far end on 20 millivolts per division okay. as well. And there we go. And we'll do the same thing. We'll put a, add a little averaging just to clean it up a little bit because it's so fast. And there it is. And so we have that signature of near end, signature of far end. And sure enough, the cables are all about basically the same length over here. And so we see this signal coming out uh, here. And at exactly the same time, the far end crosswalk has gotten over here. They both get into the scope at the same time. Here's that signal coming out on channel one or the aggressor. And here's that far end on the victim one. Exactly what we saw in the simulation. Very nice. Okay, and so now, now disconnect the yellow one. Ah, okay. So let's see. So you want me to disconnect the yellow one? Yes. So that we have an open here, yes. and this That's is going to reflect simulation. back and forth. Yeah. Okay. So there's one slight problem, <laughs> but we can fix that. The problem is I'm using that to trigger the. Oh, okay. <laughs> but you know what? That's okay because while we're here, let's trigger on the near end. So I'm gonna change the triggering to channel two. And I, here's the little, little trigger level. And so now we're gonna trigger on, on channel two, the near end cross sock. Now I can disconnect the, um, the, the signal uh, coming out over here and we'll make an open here. Actually, you know what I could do? Even simpler, I should have thought of it. I could just make that one meg input, right? That'll do it hey. too. Yeah, but okay. then I'm going to have then I'm going to have the reflections at the end of the cable here. That's harder to figure out. So I'm going to do what you said. I'm going to just disconnect it over here. Okay. So let's do that. So uh, what do you expect? So rule number nine. What do you expect to see? Uh, ringing in the crosstalk. Yeah. So the crosslist is signal is going to come this way. Um, I'll see the same near end crosstalk. In fact, let's save the near end crosstalk so we can compare that. So we're gonna save uh, the channel two, that's the near end crosstalk. And we're gonna save it in memory and we'll save it in, I think two is a pink color. So there it is. And I'm gonna move it over here just so we can compare it, okay? So we're gonna disconnect this guy. Signal's gonna come down here. We're gonna see exactly the same near end crosstalk. It's gonna come down over here. It's gonna reflect, it's gonna head back. And then, you know, when, when we get that, near end dying, we're going to see far end cross duct burst, right? So that's what we'll see. And of course, we, um, once it comes over here, this is 50 ohms. So I think we're going to be terminated over here because this okay. is the source. Ah, okay. Okay. Right. So, but we'll see. So it, looking over there here, should not sorry. be so many ringing. Yeah. Right. But when we look over here at physically the near end, we're going to see the contribution of the reflected signal coming this way. So this will see forward going um, uh, crosstalk, even though we're looking at physically the near end. And so I, I like to call this, we get a two for one. Looking at this end, we're able to characterize both the near end and the far end crosstalk. Okay? Okay. Let's try that. So I'm gonna disconnect this guy here and let's see what happens. Now, I have to be careful about my connections as well. Okay, so, gosh, it's all over the place. How come? <laughs> so this again is, you know, nothing is ever perfect. And so I turned on averaging and my trigger level is, gonna, is triggering off of a couple different levels. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna turn off averaging it was only five sweeps, but that's okay. So I'm gonna turn on just the one and then we're gonna adjust. So you can see we're, we're, our trigger's off. I need to tweak the trigger a little bit. 
There we go. And, um, and you know, I'm going to move this guy over just a tad so we can compare them. There we go. So um, I, I, ju I adjusted the triggering to um, uh, so that it's, it's a clean trigger. This is so nice. You can also see cool? the... Yeah. <gasps> You're right. Look at that. Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to turn on averaging here just to clean it up a little bit. Uh, just, you know, because we're pushing the limit of the poor little scope here. So look, near and cross is exactly the same. Exactly the same. The far and and look, we've got the far end crosstalk that uh, reflects from here, head back, and now we see far end crosstalk over here. And you can see the also little, the near end crosstalk oh, on the other one. Oh, look at that! <laughs> You're right. We get a two for one over here. The signals coming out over here. We see far end crosstalk. We get a reflection. The signal starts traveling back this way. This becomes the backward direction of crosstalk, and we get the backward direction of crosstalk and because and so we, yeah, yeah and because the uh, uh impedance is 50 ohm on the aggressor yeah. it means it's only once and then it right. disappears if right. the impedance would be not 50 ohms then we would see right. more this right and um another time so i have other sources here that are low impedance and one of the things we're experimenting with in my lab is um finding some other sources that we can gang up in parallel to get really low output impedances so that we can look for those, look at and demonstrate those kinds of reflections. So another time we'll look at, we'll look at that. So there this we is, go. Yeah, this is like super, super useful. Isn't this cool? I mean, you can, you can apply the principles that we did the first time to understand what to expect to see. We can do a simulation that includes the, the, the fringe field coupling to predict what we see, we can build a test vehicle that uh, has those same features and we can make them it very clean to separate all the extraneous things. And we can, we can do the measurement and we can understand all the details based on our understanding and do those consistency tests. And that's really the foundation of engineering. We take these simple model cases, we understand them first and then we apply those principles to more complex systems in the, in the, in the real world. And, and this is what we teach at, um, in our classes at uh, University of Colorado in Boulder. We establish that firm foundation of engineering understanding. We apply simulation measurement tools with the, the principles, simulation measurement tools, so we can build these structures. And one of the things that we do in my advanced class is we actually take the measurement from the scope these voltage versus time waveforms. We take the measurement from the scope. We take the, alt this is a, done in Altium. We take the design, we bring it into our simulation environment. We build either transmission line models or the 3D models from the layout. We simulate what we expect to see and we compare it to the measurement. And if you know the material properties really well, and of course we've got the geometry, it is remarkable how close agreement we can get between measurement and simulation. And, and I think that it is such a, a valuable exercise to go through, to realize that even though the world looks complicated, if you understand the fundamental principles, we can really predict very accurately um, what to expect to see. And, um, and, uh, and, and that's where the, that, that feeling of confidence comes in when you get good measurement simulation correlation. Thank you so, so much, Eric, for showing it's been this demonstration. a lot of fun. I always love doing these, uh, these demos because, hey, this is the real world. This is the measurements or the anchor to reality. And uh, that's everything for today's video. I would like to thank you very much to Eric for finding time to make this call. And uh, I, uh, I really hope uh, I didn't ask too many <laughs> not very clever questions. When I watched this uh, video like for a fifth time, fifth times, I was like, oh, why I ask these questions? But Eric is uh, really patient and uh, he didn't point out all my mistakes. Uh, and uh, I need to say, after we finish this video, 
I feel like much better in understanding crosstalk. And uh, if you haven't watched our previous video with Eric, I really would like to recommend you to watch this video, not because I would like to get more views, but because uh, these uh, two videos together, the previous one and this one, they are explaining crosstalk very well. And uh, you will not only understand better the crosstalk, but it can help you to understand also a little bit more about the reflections and uh, terminations. It can help you to understand a little bit more what is happening in your PCB. That's why these two videos are like super useful and they are very well explained. Um, okay, so basically, as I said, that's everything for today's video. Leave comments and let me know what you think about this video. Also, leave comments for Eric. Let Eric know what you think, how he is explaining this kind of super complicated topic. If you like this video, don't forget press like button. Uh, if you would like to see future videos, don't forget to subscribe because when you subscribe, you are helping me a lot. Uh, it's then for me much easier to contact these very important people and talk to them. So you are helping to create these kind of videos. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Bye.